Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for the first of the sessions this afternoon. Um, we are going to uh, make a heroic attempt to, tr to stay on task and on time. So that's my moderator's job. So the first moderator's job is to introduce my esteemed panel, uh, David Oshinsky, David Hahn, and myself, Chris Sorkness. So we're each going to take a different perspective um, related to our task today and starting with the disease asthma. Uh, asthma is a chronic airway disease in which the airways become inflamed, making it hard to breathe. It can be mild, moderate, or serious, even life-threatening. There are case reports that a first asthma episode causes a loss of life, which is a daunting thought. Rare, but it happens. And this is a disease that's manifested by cough, shortness of breath, or trouble breathing, wheezing and tightness, or pain in the chest. The, the burden of asthma in the United States is immense. Uh, one of our first speakers talked about the fact that 17.5% of chronic illnesses are related to chronic pulmonary diseases, and asthma is one of those. It is an equal age opportunity employer. It costs the U.S. $56 billion a year with an immense amount of missed days of school, the number one reason why kids miss school and parents miss work because their kids miss school. And also, if you happen to be an adult that works with asthma, you um, miss work. At least 18.7 million adults in the United States have asthma, one in 12, seven million children with asthma in the United States, and nine people die from asthma each day, which I would consider um, an abject failure. So we're going to, uh, to address um, perspectives today about what you all th need to think about at a research conference to help make a difference. And with that, I'm going to uh, bring David to start our perspective. <laughs> OK, so it started for me very uh, innocently and unthreateningly. Uh, at an early age when I um, developed hay fever, around age five or so. And it's kind of a miserable seasonal thing, but not such a big deal. <clears throat> Fall season, mainly, at that point. Um, when I was 12, I had the first of my significant bicycling accidents in my lifetime, <clears throat> where I fractured a bone. Um, and I ended up in a hospital bed. And while I was laid up in the hospital bed, uh, being treated for a fractured femur. At that time, they didn't get you up right away. Um, I developed some wheezing symptoms, and they pronounced me with asthma, and I was treated for that, I guess, you know, using whatever, bronchodilators, or the drugs were different at that time, maybe. Uh, it was no big deal. Um, so around age 18 or so, my uh, mother had suggested I get allergy testing, and so I did, and they found I was allergic to most everything which is rather daunting. Um, and I had allergy so shots for a few years. Um, so through around age 22, it was really very mild symptoms, well controlled with the asthma. Um, I was living in a cockroach infested apartment in the city of Boston. I was in grad school. Uh, around age 23 or so, uh, when all of a sudden I developed a respiratory infection, which they, they called it pneumonitis. I guess it's a bronchitis or a pneumonia or something like that. Um, and all of a sudden, my asthma became absolutely terrible. <clears throat> it would keep me up all night, uh, hacking cough, um, terrible wheezing. I basically thought I was going to die a, n a, n a number of times um, with this. Um, I remember one of the early occurrences. I had a test the next day at school, and I was up all night. And I just went in and took the test. And I don't know how I did all right on it, but somehow I did. Um, but anyway, I thought a number of times that this was going to be the end of me. So um, I did uh, see, well, the, uh, the doctor had treated pneumonitis. He put me on a cough suppressant and, and an erythromycin, something, you know, and an antibiotic for a short time. And basically, it just kept getting worse and worse. 
ended up in the ER once or twice, I don't recall how many times, and they said, oh, you never should have been put on a cough suppressant, so took me off that, changed things. I went to an allergy specialist, they put me on uh, injected prednisone and other assorted things and uh, the adrenaline shots and whatever else. And So anyway, <clears throat> uh, it kind of stabilized a bit and toned down and I basically finished grad school, moved out to the suburbs, and it seemed to just be kind of, you know, more, more stable and not as threatening to my life. Uh, eventually when inhaled steroids came on the scene, I would start taking those, Flovent, uh, with Cerevent, which is long-acting bronchodilator, I guess. Um, and, uh, but the dosage with the Flovent kept creeping up, and the symptoms really were not well controlled at all. I ended up with the maximum recommended dose. I was on the strongest flow vent, you know, four, four puffs twice a day or something like that, maybe two puffs twice a day. Um, so uh, I became very concerned that uh, I might not survive this long term and that I would end up with COPD, emphysema or something uh, eventually, and I was really desperate to find a solution for this, and I was kind of looking around. I was thinking, you know, what if it's an infection of some kind? Um, I thought first, well, maybe, maybe it's like a fungal infection. So I w happened to be on Lamisil, which is an antifungal drug, for like a, a bunch of weeks for an unrelated condition, and didn't affect the asthma one bit. So I thought, no, not that. <clears throat> then I had another bicycling accident. I got hit by a car. Um, I ended up with a broken pelvis. And uh, so to make a long story short, I was running a high fever. At one point, I ended up in the ER for that while well, I had the broken pelvis. And uh, I had a Z-Pak, azithromycin. Wonderful stuff, let me tell you. I made the asthma a lot better for a week or two or something, and I started thinking, you know, what is going on here? Um, and I searched the web, and I found Jim Quinlan's website, asthmastory.com. All one word, no punctuation, except the dot com. Um, so to make a long story short, I spoke with him by email, and I found out about uh, Dr. Hahn's research. Um, azithromycin, okay. Azithromycin for asthma. I discussed this uh, with two different doctors, one my own, the other my brother-in-law. They uh, basically uh, thought it would not work. My own doctor declined to prescribe, so to make a long story short, I got the azithromycin on my own and I put myself on it. Um, and I was on for quite a while and all the symptoms went away. I stopped taking any asthma medications. <clears throat> so what are my unmet needs as an asthma patient? Um, I've been self-treating since around 2003 and uh, I can't get treatment from a local physician that I'm aware of because this is not part of the uh, guidelines. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so this is a major problem. People who don't find out about this accidentally can end up dying from it because it's severe refractory asthma. And uh, why isn't this more widely available and through medical professionals? To me, it's a slam dunk. If everything else is not working, then you got nothing to lose. Try something different. Uh, in this one, there is some proof behind it, but it could be better proof. So we need more research to provide better proof that this works or doesn't work or whatever the case might be. Um, <clears throat> another thing uh, that's difficult about this for me is my asthma has recurred over and over. Uh, so I've taken zithro Zithromax, Zithromycin over and over, and at this point I have mild asthma. So. The second bullet basically has to do with, you know, being able to understand what's causing the disease. Uh, <clears throat> now the third, the third bullet has to do with um, better treatment since it, it seems as if thermicin does not fully eradicate chlamydia pneumonia, which is what is suspected to be causing this, a persistent infection. Um, I've recently tried experimenting on myself with some other antibiotics piled on top, and that experiment is un is ongoing doxycycline and metronidazole. <clears throat> the last one for only short bursts because it's nasty. Um, so 
there needs to be better treatments for this, but it definitely works up to a point. And for some people, like uh, Jim Quinlan, he's still asthma free. So why is it that some people it works and others it works for a short time? Uh, all these things are mysterious and there's more research needed. Uh, I'm going to talk about challenges and opportunities in asthma as <clears throat> my, from my perspective as a practicing clinician for uh, the majority of my 35 plus years of practice. Uh, I found challenges really in all three of these areas in diagnosis, monitoring, and treatment. For diagnosing, I, uh, I recognized how difficult it was sometimes to measure reversible airway obstruction, which is a hallmark of asthma. And, and I know it's not routinely practiced in many, many settings. Um, the other uh, corollary here are um, dealing with patients who had other lung conditions, including asthma. We, we don't know uh, enough about, about them. <clears throat> in monitoring, documenting progress was always difficult. And I, I know it's not done routinely in many practices. So I think that's an area we, we could uh, focus on. And in treatment, uh, my patients tended to be challenged most by the high cost of medications and steroid issues. And by that, I mean either steroid side effects or sort of an, adverse, an adver aversion to taking steroid medications for various reasons. And then lastly, uh, you've heard a bit already, people who didn't respond to the usual treatments, it's, and that's called refractory asthma. Um, so the opportunities I see for REN, from my perspective, in diagnosis, I'd like to hear more about the use of peak flow meters and newer handheld devices in actually re documenting reversible airway obstruction. <clears throat> that's not currently uh, recommended in guidelines, but I think there are, based on my experience, some opportunities to look into that. In terms of monitoring, I have to have, give a shout out to my colleague, Dr. Sorkness, for helping to develop something called the asthma control test, which is a very simple patient-reported outcome measure that's been validated for asthma. And I uh, think it would be very helpful to uh, investigate its use and applicability in primary care. And lastly, in treatment, there are really two issues. One is optimizing current treatments, which uh, I am going to uh, defer to Dr. Sorkness. And the second that you've already heard about is macrolides for refractory asthma, which has been a research topic that Ren has helped with over the last 20 years. So just to put things in perspective, um, fortunately, the vast majority of asthma patients are relatively well controlled. This is data from uh, Kaiser San Diego, where they were able to, to char characterize their entire population into either low risk or high risk. And, and um, high adherence to medications or low adherence. So the group, the, there's a substantial minority of patients here in yellow who they char characterized as high risk. In other words, they were not doing well. They were being hospitalized or going to the ER, and they were low adherent. Uh, that's a target for optimizing current treatments. Many of those patients were probably going to do well with current treatment. Some of them might be refractory, but we don't know until you try. The small group, this in their case, 11%, were high risk, high adherent. Um, patients who had uh, severe disease were taking full doses of guideline medication and still not doing well. This is sort of the refractory group. It's a minority. Uh, it's estimated to be 5 to 10, maybe 15% of patients. But it still accounts for 2 to 3 million um, Americans. And, uh, tens of millions worldwide. So I think it's worth uh, its own uh, research. So in terms of diagnosis, as I said, reversibility is a hallmark of asthma. Many patients are not tested. Is there a role for peak flow? It's inexpensive and, and available, uh, but it requires patient and clinic training. So there's pluses and minuses, and we really don't know uh, what its, its true role is. In terms of monitoring, as I said, documentation is usually lacking. What are the best and most practical methods for, for uh, monitoring control? Uh, I, I think the asthma control test is dynamite, and I'd really like to study that. 
And um, probably to incentivize that research, I think it's worth knowing that the ACT is, is being adopted as a quality metric in many settings. So I think it's going to be something we have to do whether we have the evidence or not. Uh, and then in ter terms of treatment, I'm going to defer optimization. I'm going to s say a few words about refractory asthma and the r possible role for azithromycin. Um, is asthma caused by an infection? Well, the, the cause may not be apparent in late stage disease, so it's best to study at the very beginning uh, of the, uh, the first wheezing episode. And I was actually able to find 10 patients with what I called de novo wheezing, uh, the very first time a patient developed wheezing after careful history. Four recovered without treatment, that's the asthmatic bronchitis, which we're not supposed to treat with antibiotics, and I didn't, and they got better. Five went on to develop chronic asthma that was diagnosed appropriately by expert criteria, and one developed chronic bronchitis. But there's been no further practice-based studies of de novo wheezing. And this is important because I, what I haven't told you is I collected microbiologic specimens on these people, and we were able, through validated methods, to determine each one of them had an acute C. pneumoniae infection. In fact, the patient who developed chronic bronchitis had C. pneumoniae cultured from his sputum six months after development of his condition. And the six patients who, uh, with asthma or chronic bronchitis, all resolved their condition after a prolonged course of appropriate antibiotics. So that's, that's one of the reasons I um, was motivated to uh, pursue this area. So why macrolides for asthma? Um, they are active against a typical organism, such as C. pneumoniae and others that might be involved. They also have anti-inflammatory properties that might be useful in asthma. A meta-analysis of 12 randomized trials showed um, beneficial effects of macrolides in the long-term management of asthma in terms of symptoms, quality of life, hyperreactivity, and peak flow. The limitations were these were all small pilot or preliminary studies, and it's really not entirely clear from this meta-analysis who benefits most, who's the target population. So <clears throat> I believe the target population are the most severe refractory patients, and this is some evidence in support of this. This was our last REN-sponsored study published uh, several years ago in the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine uh, called Asthmatics. There are three groups here. The, uh, this was a group of fairly mild to moderate asthmatics who were randomized to sugar pill. This was a group of patients who were randomized to azithromycin. They were treated from zero to three months and then followed without any antibiotics up to 12 months. <clears throat> During this study, many patients with a story very similar to what you just heard, David's story, approached me and wanted to be in the study, and I said, I think you're a good candidate, so I'd be happy to have you in the study. When they learned they, were going, they had a 50% chance of being randomized to placebo, they said, oh, I want to be in your study, but I don't want placebo. So we had to open an open label arm. That's what the refractory is. These are folks who got open label azithromycin prescribed by their clinician off study, and then they answered the same outcomes throughout the study. Um, it has some limitations, but as you can see, the response was rather tremendous in that group. In the azithromycin group the, of the milder patients, it's um, um, not, as, not as apparent that there's an effect. This was not a statistically significant. Whether that's due to low power or other factors, I don't know. This kind of a response of quality of life of uh, 1.5 units is unprecedented in my experience and much a log uh, greater than in most studies of uh, traditional therapy. So could it be infectious? Uh, infections on no organization's research agenda, unfortunately. The guidelines currently recommend against macrolides for the reasons I described, yet patients with refractory asthma are seeking macrolides. I'm contacted several times a week by such people. Um, so to summarize, diagnosis, what's the role for office home peak flow meters, monitoring, how best to use the ACT, and in treatment, how to address emerging evidence for macrolides. What could REN do? 
given that patients are uh, asking for this and more and more doctors are actually becoming aware of the evidence and actually considering using it, why not take advantage of this um, natural experiment to create a registry uh, carefully uh, documenting um, patient eligibility criteria, shared decision-making, treatment, and monitoring, most importantly, for uh, the outcomes of macrolide treat treated patients. Thank you. I'm, pre I'm presenting the major challenges and opportunities in asthma from the research perspective. Um, I'm not going to um, uh, apologize for taking the research perspective because in my stance and why you're here at a research conference is the fact that research is the way that we ask the right questions and answer them and how we can um, uh, globally uh, take the diseases that we're talking about today and others and try to do the best we can um, for the patients that uh, we take care of. So um, Regina asked me to particularly focus on what's not known, how can it be addressed by partnerships, and how, how can primary care specialists respond. Um, I think it's important um, when People are brought together in a state, and I, I'm glad some of you are outside of Wisconsin, but most of us are from our state, to know the state we live in and the burden of a disease. Um, this is data from 2010 in which um, asthma in our state was diagnosed in 14% of adults and 10% of children. Uh, we have racial disparities in this disease, just like nationwide trends, where it is uh, driven by African Americans, who not only have a greater prevalence, but they're hospitalized to a greater extent, their mortality is higher, and in our state, Native Americans also have an increase in hospital rates. I personally find that unacceptable, and I think part of our challenge as, uh, as a state. Milwaukee County has the highest hospitalization and ED visit rates, predominantly determined by the urban environment, but also it is a place where most of our um, racial and ethnic minorities live. And Menominee County also has the second highest rate, again, uh, the residents of most of our Native American population. Uh, there is data about age and gender. Um, less than, uh, children less than five years of age have high, the highest hospitalization in ED rates. Um, males are more severely impacted during childhood. Females um, have more frequent adverse event asthma outcomes in adulthood, and we have a very prevalent disease in this state, um, actually more than national trends. And we don't do a very good job of medically managing in this as of medically managing asthma. Um, how we follow our guidelines in Wisconsin falls far short of what's recommended, typical of just about every state. Um, I would say then that the epidemiology of this disease um, basically has lessons for both practice and research. Um, you can see that uh, uh, in this graph, um, females um, have at least as much asthma as males, so our clinical trials ought to enroll at least 50% of women. Um, you can see that, uh, that there is a disparity in this state of prevalence of African Americans as well as non-Hispanic blacks and Puerto Ricans, and clearly below the poverty guideline. And, and so I think we need to find ways to invite diverse, diverse populations to be part of asthma studies in this state. This is the example of, um, in ch pediatric studies and in the populations you see in practice, this is before the age of 15, a disease of males. Um, at which time by the age of puberty, um, uh, the trends change. There are lots of change that happen in this age group as kids cross to the dark side, for those of you that have adolescents. Um, you can see, though, that this has a very practical implication of as, uh, as both men and women age, um, the changes here, and I can tell you we have no idea um, but lots of, lots of postulates 
of why this change occurs, um, a very researchable res um, question. Um, David pleaded as one of the things he wanted to see is how do, how do we determine the true severity of disease characterized by root causes? So asthma is now moving to sophistication, just like arthritis and cancers of, um, it's not a basket diagnosis, we have phenotypes. Phenotypes, a fancy word that says there's arthritis and there's osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, and we don't treat them all the same. Same thing with asthma. Over the course of time, and anchoring you to 1970 with the advent of the inhaled corticosteroids, changed revolutionary the way we treat and manage asthma, the appreciation that drove it of eosinophils and um, inflammatory cells that drove the disease. Um, this has had a dip um, and has increased um, of recent in the last decade. And what you will see coming out on the marketplace is a whole bunch of monoclonal antibodies that just like in arthritis are very expensive, but very successful in targeting um, allergic disease. Um, and will in essence by that um, understanding of a diagnosis change what we can do. There is, however, this little group down here, this TH2 low group. And this gets to the sophistication of the diagnosis that I heard both Davids talk about, is asthma's the same symptoms across the board. We have over here all of these uh, early onset allergic kind of people that are very corticosteroid responsive, easy to treat, but we have a whole group of people over here uh, representing David's story and others that probably is a disease that um, is uh, driven by neutrophils, a very different disease, might be a disease type that is very susceptible um, to antibiotics and other, other um, approaches. Um, there is a, a varying degree of severity and what we know a lot about this end of the spectrum is the fact of a lot of comorbid disease, obesity, COPD, rhinosinusitis, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and others. So the asthma community, the research community, is trying to answer the question you asked about how can we better bucket this particular disease. Now, one of the things that's new, and I um, encourage you to get a better handle on, is the fact that um, the asthma guidelines are changing. Um, I happen and I actually agree with the wise Pat McBride about the challenges right now of the fact of providing to clinicians the best evidence base we can do so they can pick the right drugs and that we can find educational information in a partnership to share so that we get people headed in the right path. Um, the global initiative of asthma are guidelines that are totally redone in 2014 with much of the new evidence base from clinical trials, but it has a new look. Um, it's what should be done, why it should be done, and how it can be implemented more effectively. As um, directed specifically for primary care. There are lots of key contact cha content changes, a new practical definition of asthma that acknowledges this heterogeneous disease and makes us start diagnosing better and picking the right therapy, assessing both control and risk factors plus future risk, algorithms for distinguishing uncontrolled disease broadly Maybe it's the wrong drug picked, like inhaled steroids for all, which is probably not the right thing to do. And severe disease, which requires treatment to make a decision that it's severe and recalcitrant, like, it, like the, de, the de descriptions that our two Davids um, put forth, and recognizing this is a disease, fortunately, of 5 to 10% of people, 
and the, mo the majority of patients that you are on the front line of treating are the other 85 to 90 percent of people in which we can all make a difference, um, including adherence issues and many others. The other approach with these guidelines are three components of control-based management. This is all about patient management and self-management, assessment, adjustment of treatment, and reviewing response. Um, expanded indications for starting controller therapy, particularly in the intermittent Weezer. Tailoring asthma treatment for individuals. A whole paragraph, or a whole um, a chapter about the asthma COPD overlap syndrome, which I believe is a significant part of the patients you treat, and now that there are clinical trials that will address it. Continuum of care for worsening asthma from early self-management through to primary care and acute care management, and this new approach to diagnosing. Um, I'm not going to belabor this so that we have time for a, a panel, but there is growing information and things that can be incorporated into practice and in asking research questions about how do we best identify patients at risk. Um, they are about individuals who have a lot of exacerbations. Their pulmonary function measurements make a difference in predicting risk as well as some of these cellular types and the presence of allergies. I would ask as a main research question is, how can these risks be practically incorporated into practice? And if we do, will it make a difference? Also, there are predictors of difficult to control disease. Um, these are individuals with variability of symptoms, a lot of exacerbations. The single best predictors from large studies in the inner city across ages are it's about pulmonary function testing, to know how bad people are and if they reverse concurrent diseases and the issue of sensitivity. So the research challenge to you all is what would happen if all patients had pulmonary function measurements and reversibility, if they had a simple rhinosinusitis assessment and an allergy evaluation, and we coupled this with the GINA guidelines recommendations of asthma action plan, self-management, relevant, accurate education, and 24-7 contact when people are in trouble. So one terrific research question, and it is my um, segue to, um, you can think about for your research agenda anything you want tomorrow, but you have to include pulmonary diseases. That's where the action at. Am I biased? I am, absolutely. I acknowledge it but you're missing a golden opportunity of a disease to make a difference. What, for example, uh, will make a difference? What if, will these guidelines be adopted? How can we incorporate the adoption of these guidelines into care, and how can we increase the odds? How best can the human, humanomics principles and GINA be implemented, taking into account um, outcomes that shape and influence individual patients? How can we conduct the best trials we can, make them pragmatic if needed, make broad inclusion criteria, and um, conduct them to decide how best to individualize treatment, um, as we've heard? And how can both primary care specialists and patients make it happen? How can they work with asthma specialists who um, are interested in partnerships, and how can we work with teams such as nurses, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, and social workers, and many, many others to try to make a difference. So um, that's my plea for your research agenda tomorrow. And I'm going to now uh, moderate a panel of questions that uh, we will take from the audience. So please pick a David or myself uh, when you address your question. I just want to make, is this working? Okay, I just want to make a shout out from the PCORI perspective. Our conference is funded by PCORI.
they really are into something called comparative effectiveness research. And I think there's no better subject to investigate in that paradigm than comparing in a probably cluster randomized trial implementation of the sort of uh, guideline that you s suggest versus what we're doing now to test to see what would happen. I, I, I think that's a great idea. So, David, this is a, that was a good segue to my question, which I feel obliged to ask, because it looks like you were bordering on uh, making an off-label recommendation for azithromycin. And uh, if you would please disclose whether or not you have any financial interest in selling more azithromycin. Good, good question. Uh, I've done 30 years of research and never received a penny of compensation for any of it, and I don't, I don't have any uh, financial interests, and um, I'm not recommending off-label use. I'm recommending that if a patient uh, comes to a clinician bringing with them the level of evidence that exists and asking to have a, a discussion about it, that, that that discussion take place. Dave, um, on the azithromycin, do you obtain a EKG on all your patients before you put them on long-term azithromycin to, to look for QT prolongation? Uh, no. Um, that's recommended by um, specialty groups, but in fact, um, there have been two or more uh, trials in heart disease. Uh, tens of thousands of patients randomized to weekly azithromycin for a year. Uh, and they didn't do that, and they didn't do liver function, and they found they were not able to detect that sort of adverse event. It might have occurred, uh, but if it did, it was below the threshold of detection. The only uh, major clinical consequence of taking azithromycin long-term is a decrease in bronchitis and pneumonia, as you might expect. So I, I'd like to just quickly address that as well, and I, I, I would take a little bit greater caution with, with the response in that the, the COPD trials, and there is one very large trial conducted by the NHLBI that basically um, selected patients with COPD who were frequent exacerbators um, from the issue of would chronic azithromycin make a difference in those for exacerbations because of, in essence, effect on morbidity and mortality in COPD. And they actually did QTC intervals as uh, baselines that did not randomize anybody into the trial um, that, that did need, not meet entry criteria, and also did hearing, baseline hearing tests to look at chronic use. And so, so I, I would say, in putting my researcher's hat on, that I think that the whole issue about careful patient sec selection and that there are clearly, um, at least from the COPD literature, we don't have any assurance in using, basically, long-term erythromycin that that would be acceptable to do. And I think that there are risk patients. Yeah, I, I would agree in, the, in this context of clinical trials, that's, that's almost a necessity, as is hearing testing, uh, testing for uh, res resistant organisms. And I would also add, um, testing for a spread of resistant organisms into communities. These are all things that I think should be parts of clinical trials, but I thought your question was in terms of individual shared decision making. If a clinician wants to do an EKG, I think that's perfectly fine, but I, I know from experience that is not usual practice right now. If you consider all the people in the world who get azithromycin. How many of you do EKGs before you prescribe a ZPAC? How many of you, raise your hands, how many, you prescribe, how many of you have prescribed azithromycin in your practice? Okay, see, that's what I'm getting at. What's the typical length of time that you put somebody on it? I realize you don't have as much research as you'd like around it, but if you are trialing it with a patient. Well, first of all, I'd like to hope that we can broaden the discussion. I think this is a, obviously an interesting topic to me, but for the purposes of this meeting, let's try to ask other questions. But duration, duration, duration. Nobody knows how long it takes to, um, if in fact 
infection is at the root of this effect, and, and that's not entirely clear. Uh, we know the, from the microbiology of C. pneumoniae, it's, it's virtually impossible or difficult to eradicate chronic infection. So long-term treatment, three months, um, obviously has clinical benefit for some patients, as I described. Um, for those who relapse after three months, another three months often does the trick. Um, it's, a, it's an area that needs to be researched. Uh, I'm not sure that REN is the right venue for all of that because it's much more complex than you might suspect. So. Okay, we're getting the zero minutes, so I'm going to accept this as the last question. Um, so I guess I heard a few things. It's interesting, insurance companies haven't grabbed onto asthma and COPD as a quality indicator yet, and I, it's not because of less morbidity or mortality. It's simply because we don't have those nice numbers to put a hook on. Um, and so what I heard from uh, Mr. Shinsky, David Shinsky, was the. Uh, you know, there's this group of people, it's very frustrating, we have the, this paradigm of how we're supposed to manage asthma, but there's a group of people, it, it doesn't work for them at all. And, and so having multiple uh, sort of pathways uh, for those patients. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how you think peak flows would be useful. I mean, is there any preliminary uh, data on how that could be useful? It sounds like the ACT is, is something that is ready for prime time and that we, we, we really could be using right now as, as a way to measure quality. So I'll take a crack and let David finish. Um, whether it's the asthma control test or the pediatric version, the childhood asthma control test, or a couple other validated control tests, they're easy to use. Um, they, they truly are a patient-centered and reported outcome that has been used internationally and validated. and it tells us something important of relevance on the basis of um, asthma control in individuals. It's easy, and it is pay for performance in many places. And it addresses the dimension of asthma of control, but does not at all deal with the risk, the risk of exacerbations and the emerging data that failure to, in essence, prevent exacerbations, especially in kids that get them early on will progress to loss of lung function and um, seem to be very high predictors of COPD. Um, I remember vividly um, when I started uh, working with an asthma specialist in 1980 that I saw a 22-year-old woman that had had lifelong asthma, um, prednisone most of her life, and her spirometry at the age of 22 showed an FEV1 percent predicted of 40 percent. So I would suggest that in particular, if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, and the biggest predictor of exacerbations in death in the United States is spirometry, some measure of pulmonary function, whether it's FEV1, maybe peak flow, but we need to do better because the data is there that it can make a difference. Interestingly, this is a person that ultimately, and I think speaking to the issue of randomized control trials of efficacy, this is a person that I met in a context of enrolling in fluticasone trial for steroid-dependent disease. Within the matter of um, a, a year eventually getting this person totally off prednisone and improving her pulmonary function to ultimately 65 percent predicted in a 22-year-old. So, so I think whether it's severe disease of clearly knowing where we are, but I would also say this frequent exacerbator that um, the asthma control test may be very deceiving of, of not knowing and individualizing and picking the right therapy. And I think these trials incorporated in big family practice are screaming to be done and will make a difference. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I've done no research on the ACT. I've used it in practice. I love it. I agree with the comments about uh, having to take other factors into account because it doesn't tell the whole story. We're over time, I'm afraid. So yes, so we're going to have to. Thank you very much.